Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Canada Today on Muslim Network TV. I'm your host, Taha Ghayur, once again with another exciting episode of Muslim Changemakers. And as you know, for a lot of communities across the world and across Canada, uh, even the biggest concern or stress comes from thinking about uh, how to provide for your family and for yourself the next meal. Uh, our neighbors, many of them are living, you know, sometimes next, just next door or down the street. You know, they don't even know um, uh, what, uh, what the next meal is going to look like, where that's going to come from and where to find it. Um, while Canada being one of the wealthiest countries in the world, reports, reports have shown um, that the food bank use has been on the rise. We know um, that uh, even the number of employed people are requiring food assistance in Canada, uh, reportedly jumping uh, up to 30% over the past three years. Uh, and this, of course, this number has uh, increased significantly uh, due to the COVID-19 situation. We have also seen unprecedented uh, amounts of stockpiling and food shortages in grocery stores. Um, as a result, uh, uh, some of the most vulnerable people in our society are dealing with major, major challenges from, you know, issue lack of poor nutrients to hunger and homelessness even. Today, we'll be speaking to an incredibly selfless community volunteer uh, who hails from Montreal. She's been serving the poor and homeless uh, in her community for over 30 years. Uh, we'll be uh, you know, speaking to an inspirational catalyst uh, behind the Sister Sabria Foundation. Um, I'm so uh, honored to actually be talking to Sister Sabria bint Hussein today as our Muslim change maker uh, on this episode today. Assalamu alaikum, Sister Sabria, and thank you for being here with us today. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, so just a little bit about you uh, that we want to share with uh, our friends who may not be aware, even though, mashallah, you are a very humble celebrity, especially in the Montreal region. A lot of people already are aware of you. Um, so Sister Sabria has been involved in the Montreal Muslim community for over 30 decades, uh, sorry, three decades or 30 years uh, since completing her international uh, cuisine courses in Malaysia's capital city of Kuala Lumpur. Lending much of her time to the Muslim community and the masjids, she has prepared hundreds of thousands of meals for mosques across Montreal and Quebec. Sister Sabria also works with Rivers at Community Church and Unity Church. She runs a women's shelter out of her own home, mashallah, called Our Second Home. Today, um, I'm really excited to, um, to discuss a few things about her work and about her life uh, on Canada Today Show. So let's start off, uh, Sister Sabria, with uh, your organization. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about Sister Sabria Foundation? What activities does it offer? And uh, what's, what, what was behind uh, this whole idea of starting this organization back in 2017? Assalamu alaikum yeah, Sabria Foundation, uh, which was formed only about three years ago. And, um, but it's been going on for about 30, 35 years in mm -hmm. in Korea. Uh, but I started with being alone in going to the homeless, going to the masjid, to the, you know, the other organizations. And even I went to extreme event. I went to the churches to ask if there was a And I think that I was able to get involved with churches uh, to also get involved with the activities, especially for the women. Mm. And, uh, and also, I'm running this uh, survey for which we also run the um, so called shelter for sisters in trouble who is really who are in dire need of help and uh, who can be sheltered temporarily. 
within the span of 30, uh, sorry, uh, 30 days. So it depends on the situation. And, uh, and I was just too happy to be that. And we also, you know, and it's for homeless, for the homeless, for the yetins, what do you say, yetins and artists, often. So for anybody who's in the I of the financial issues. Well, thank you. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that, Sister Sabria. Um, so, you know, why why were you so uh, and why have you been so involved with the with the idea of eliminating poverty um, and and really serving the poor in particular? Uh, what what is the motivation behind uh, your work that you have been doing for the past thirty years, specifically focusing on? poverty and 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 the poor and the needy in your communities why not some other cause i mean what drives you specifically and and when it comes to specifically the food itself uh, serving food to the poor so why don't you share a little bit of uh you know your thoughts on that uh, well i'll start with at home you no know, i mean uh, with my with my upbringing because i come from um, very Respectable family background, and uh, inshallah, my so I can't concentrate much because of the noise. But uh, uh, what I'm trying to say is um, how we run. Uh, how I started doing it was because of my parents. Um, they were very humble people. And I see that I, I grew up in that atmosphere where we, we were only we were only six, six of us, but he brought in more artists and uh, neighbors who are in, in dire need of help. And I began to learn to share and with my sisters as well as the others. So we end up with about 25 to 30 people in a, in a house. And uh, and that at that point, we, of course, we have to share everything, you know, even to the extent of uh, clothing and boots and shoes and, clo um, uh, you know, practically everything we have to share, especially the food. <laughs> so, and uh, I enjoy uh, doing it because I'm so used to that. And... Uh, I don't find anything that I'm missing in my life. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. I think the sheer uh, honesty my parents dealing with other people, I do want to understand life better and uh, to attend to it in a very humble and empathetic way. Inshallah. Inshallah. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. And I guess um, uh, it's interesting to, to hear from you that so much at times, uh, so much of your upbringing, uh, you know, leads to uh, to actually what you become. And it's interesting. You talk about your humble background and the fact that your family, uh, mashallah, your parents were their houses and their hearts were open to the poor, to other, you know, needy family members who actually lived in your home. And, uh, you know, from a family of eight, you became a family of 23, 25 people um, because there were other people in the community who needed help and became the orphans were actually living in your family. Mashallah, this is a beautiful, inspirational story for all the parents to actually learn from. Um, inshallah, if you want to prepare a generation of people who, who really dedicate themselves to service. Um, we saw in some of the photos just right now some awards uh, that you have received. Tell us a little bit about these awards that you have received. And I believe these are awards that you, were, you received in Malaysia. Yes, I do. I received from the King, King of Johor, which is the southern, uh, southern tip of uh, Malaysia, mm -hmm. Peninsula Malaysia, mm -hmm. Sultan of Johor. 
yeah, he, I was awarded the, the title of that team three. Um, that team three is for the people there. I mean, it's very, it's very, uh, I mean, the title itself is very, um, I, it's very touching for me. Mm. So I express more. And also in Montreal, you know, other, apart from other titles they gave me, but I also received from uh, the, uh, the uh, night food, uh, the night, the night from the mayor of Montreal. Um, I think it was the, uh, Valerie de Plant, Madame Valerie de Plant. She invited me uh, for the night. Mashallah. Uh, to explain. I'm too shy to talk about all this. Of course. I mean, you deserve a lot more, mashallah, a lot more recognition and... Yeah, uh, that kind of recognition really uh, touched me. And I'm too afraid to be, you know, the Muslim attitude, the react or something. So I try to avoid all this, uh, you know, to topics, you know, to talk too much about it. You know, that, no, that's important, but I think you're right. And, and that, that humility is important um, and that sincerity is important. And is, I'm glad, you know, you, you're concerned about that. Uh, you're right. Um, too much personal attention should bother us. Uh, too, more, too much attention, media attention. Uh, but you know what? The recognition is important uh, because it validates your work. And more importantly, it... Um, it inspires others and uh, people need to see your story and hear your story. And, and it's great for the last uh, few years now, three or four years, we've been seeing some, some co coverage, especially in the Montreal, Montreal media, Quebec media, talking about your story. Um, so, you know, tell us what is a day like for you? Uh, you know, when you start your day, um, the day when you're going to be serving and, and cooking, um for all these people what time do you start in the morning um and walk us through your typical day you know when it ends because i believe it's a very long day for you um from what i hear and mashallah it's inspiring to see all that energy that you have uh to carry on and keep doing this uh on a daily basis and weekly basis so tell us when do you start in the morning what does walk us through your day uh and how does it end typically when you are serving let's say a, a mass number of people in the masjid or in your neighborhood or, or a church near you or a homeless shelter and so on? Well, uh, the normal day, is, as of today, the, the, it's of course the uh, program changes because of COVID. And, uh, but we're talking about um, past, you know, months and years maybe. And uh, I would, uh, of course, you know, after Fajr, I don't sleep, but I always think ahead of time, like uh, even the night before, so that I can live in, I can uh, live in peace, and thinking that I know what to do with me. The next day, what is my staff? How do I arrange my things? You know, people will be coming to visit me for with problems, you know, and try to solve the problems. Sometimes going to the hospital to visit the sick, and I used to bring friends. We about you know, uh, like say three or four of us. We'll try to console those who are sick in the hospital, and even sometimes you know we read uh, Quran and Yasin and whatever we can before a, before their death. I mean, if we know that they're terminally, terminally ill patients in the hospital and but with now this COVID of course we cannot do that and then not easily it's not easy to visit the hospital so but we just read Dua in the at home and for well, now you know and uh, so if I had to cook that day for example if I have to cook you know for the church I would have to know what kind of recipe that uh, that I should know, for example, potatoes or you know, uh, minced meat with something else. It's so much for the Arabic uh, recipes that you use in minced meat, for example. 
but as for the homeless, they, of course, they like uh, pizza, they like the lasagna or uh, spaghetti. So it's a little, little different. The recipe itself demands uh, a little more thinking, you know, who we are serving on that day. So if I have to go to church, but, but they are very, very open also to, to our recipe. Like, uh, you know, even if we put curry and veggie, for example, you know, but it's not too hot. As long as it's not too hot, they are uh, willingly accepting that. Sometimes uh, it's curry puff or, you know, but the all combined one, you know, we have to, to have salad, something, uh, you know, Western, and something sometimes is Malaysian. For example, Malaysian noodles, they like uh, so much about fat. Uh, and uh, how the, the amount of food, how how much we can serve for one person, and with times for that day, maybe 200 people, 300 people, it depends. But uh, the, 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 um, sometimes it comes up to 1,000 people in the mosque for Ramadan, in Ramadan. And wow. thereby, I, I needed a lot of help, hands, uh, you know, volunteers. The volunteers come up to me and say, Alhamdulillah, there's always, uh, you know, uh, the time when Allah is there watching what we're doing, so of course we bring the uh, the energy from the young people, That's and uh, so that they get inspiration, they get uh, to know what I'm doing. And for example, I have to feed uh, one thousand people. I a certain uh, only I have certain hours to do that. So so I have groups of this doing uh, you know cutting up the onions, the group of you know making the rice, a group of uh, you know, with vegetables and salad. So there are different, but it's been quite some time. Wow. So the students sometimes they grew up until now, for example, if they were single before, but now even to, when they have four or five children, they still come to me and say, we were there for you. <laughs> we there to help you. So for example, the, for example, I have some, until now, there's a Dr. Bilal. He brought his children, uh, four children and, uh, to me, and then then we continue doing something good together and and, and so just to uh, happy about that and you know, I'm, inshallah uh, that's yeah, incredible yes when so, you see the people coming yeah. i mean and that's the other aspect i wanted to talk to you about is volunteer engagement i mean you seem to have mashallah some very good dedicated volunteers that come to you and, and are part of uh, the Sister Sabria Foundation and the work even before that you have been doing. Um, what, what is it that you think these volunteers are driven by? What excites them about the kind of work you're doing? Uh, what is so satisfying with, with the kind of work that you're doing that they keep coming back and they're part of your team? <laughs> well, I think uh, there is a uh, Something that we say, you know, the the what is it, the feeling that Allah is always with us, that Allah is watching what we're doing, Allah is going to give up the subject, the, the status later, mm. and and as you work, we talk about Islam sometimes, you know, and uh, and I joke them with very sincere jokes about they, they being helping me to change sincerity with their heart and what do you expect in general, you know? So, and even uh, that really inspired me to to be closer to them. If they're in trouble, if they are having some personal problems with their parents or what, instead of them running away, instead of them going somewhere else, they have a shelter that I, I run, that we run. Um, uh, I mean, uh, it's very, very encouraging uh, to see these youngsters um, uh, doing more work. And uh, it's not like, you know, you don't have this attitude self-centered, you know? Mm. You, you're sort of we work together as a team. And that is so, you know, gives inspiration when you work together. You're not alone. You're always having friends together and enjoying talking. And, uh, and I let them, if they are, you know, teenagers you know, or in their twenties, or if they are studying, studying what they can still mingle and explain to one another during that time when they are doing work, uh, cutting up vegetables, mm -hmm. for example. 
but they can still have ample opportunity to meet friends, to meet in a very sincere manner, in a very cozy, thinking that I was watching, you know, and um, mm -hmm. Allah is a very, uh, um, what do you call that, forgiving. Mm -hmm. So in this case, um, you know, they enjoy uh, life more and want to do more because they know, you know, something behind it. Phenomenal. I mean, uh, I guess what what you uh, have done is not only you are bringing people and volunteers for a cause, but you're also building a community around it. As you're saying, you know, people come, they share their problems, they're, you know, talking about all sorts of issues that are maybe on their minds. And at the same time, they're, and, 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 and they're building new bonds of uh, friendship, camaraderie, um, at the same time, uh, they're serving the community. And, and that's the beautiful thing about volunteering for a higher cause, basically, that you're, you're connected with, which is amazing, mashallah. So that, thank you for sharing that. So, um, you know, in one, one of the uh, interviews, you mentioned something along the lines that you're doing this because you're doing this job for Allah. Um, uh, when you volunteer, you're doing this for God and you're doing this, it, it, basically it's a job for Allah, it's a not-for-profit, it's a volunteer job for Allah. What did you mean by this? Uh, you know, wh what do you mean by doing a job for Allah? Um, how does that uh, translate into the kind of work that you keep doing, mashallah? Yeah. As I've said, we have um, to instill in ourselves the fear of Allah, the respect for Allah, and... Uh, we do it in such a way that we don't feel that we need anything else for ourselves, but we need for others. So others might need more, uh, more help. And so in this way, you know, the love for that particular person is for the love. So that you know, you combine these two, <laughs> two and two together, and you know that uh, if you are. Doing the work for Allah, Allah, Allah will help you more. You know, so mm -hmm. He will give you more and help you more. So little did you realize that it's been going on for years and years and years, and you didn't realize that it's been so long they are doing. But because you always connected with Allah and with the other, with the younger generation, you know, to to inspire them, then you feel great. You see them improvement and that so-called you know the person for 30 years and uh, it's shown improvement you know from a single uh, 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 somebody you know for example you know within the age of 18 19 20 and then he got married and then little they realized you you didn't realize that you were getting older but you have the children growing you know in front of you you know and if you feel so good uh, that you're able to yeah, so something like that. I, you know, that that's, that's great. Um, you you have uh, also, uh, I mean, in addition to your work, local work in Montreal, you're also concerned about um, refugees in Malaysia and you've built, I believe, a shelter uh, or you're in the process of building one. Can you share a little bit about what, what work you're doing there and uh, what kind of refugees uh, you're talking about? Who is this shelter for? Um, and what, again, what inspired you to do something like this? Uh, it's um, the, the one, the refugee I'm talking about is uh, those who came from uh, Rohingya and uh, and also the uh, teams around in Malaysia, in, uh, you know, whoever they feel that they, they are in dire need of help. So I have to carry on helping them and making them, uh, for example, an orphanage. Uh, with the help of those Malaysian, of course, those kind Malaysian generosity, it comes from their part too. So, so uh, I enjoy seeing the happy faces, the children's happy faces. So, uh, I enjoy being uh, their grandmother, <laughs> for example. So, uh, yes, well, we intend to build a, a house for them for building with the two or two story two uh, three or four stories high to have uh, educators to have 
water. <coughs> and uh, I enjoy seeing you know, the things they're doing uh, together and also the food the, that brought them happiness in the faces. Mm. You know, all those uh, other women or men helping me to distribute the food mm. or to the teams or to anybody who's hungry, like, uh, like here, like in Montreal too. Mm. And so I feel, I hope also there I can give a little inspiration to them, to the I mean, younger generation, especially, mm -hmm. to learn from the old elderly how we communicate and uh, uh, make it and help the younger gen, uh, I mean, those who are needy, you know, mm -hmm. to go into schools and have education, proper education, and be good people that change their uh, the people around them that can change their lives. Inshallah. Inshallah, that's that's amazing work of empowerment. How many uh, how many uh, orphans or how many kids or children are in part, going to be part or pa are part of this shelter? Or are they, they you are talking about in Malaysia? Yes, Malaysia. It's uh, if I think uh, we intend to open two, and that will be like almost two hundred students, especially especially from Rohingya and also the needy families, you know, in, in mm -hmm. Malaysia, we have still some yatims around that they should be mingling with the Rohingyas also, uh, so that they, they learn to respect and love each other, um, each other. Um, and they go um, out with different people, educated, young, aggressive, uh, you know, to, to look after themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, may God bless all the incredible effort that you're making uh, in the lives of these young people um, and giving them hope that you're providing. So uh, coming back to Montreal, um, where is all this grand feast that you cook? Where is it all cooked? Where does all the cooking happen? Sorry, I can't. Uh, I, I was, uh, I'm asking, um, where does all the cooking that you do happen? Oh, where? Yes. Where it is my apartment and my apartment. So yes. in your own now home? We have three apartments. We have three apartments. So in Ramadan, we I mean past few years because Ramadan happened to fall in uh, during the holidays. So I couldn't have the access to the university, the Concordia University, because at one time I I think within a span of eight to nine years, I was in the university kitchen uh, to help those uh, starting from students in need oh. that should come for Ramadan iftar for free. And when my friends heard about it, so they come to help us and uh, supporting me financially as well as, as uh, in a moral support. And Alhamdulillah, it went through, you know, we went through thick and thin too. To help the meal on the table so that the students will be hungry. Then, so alhamdulillah. Uh, so even, even all this food, like a thousand people, a thousand meals that you cook for a masjid, you're telling me all of that is cooked in your own apartment kitchen? Uh, not one thousand. Then the, when I went out of the, the university, mm -hmm. um, then we get in contact with the mass, and uh, it's less than a thousand. Okay. But when I was in university, they have, they have big uh, equipment. But, yes. but as uh, when I changed my apartment, so we got, I think the most we cook was 700 to 800. Wow. So much because I have three apartments, uh, you know, even the shelter kitchen, the second room, the kitchen I used, we used at that time. And uh, all the students came in my house. I love them. Alhamdulillah. We are hoping to get a bigger building, inshallah, free for us. So that there are more people, especially uh, students in trouble also. And uh, as for this Ramadan, you know, we try to help even the detainees, you know, people who went, who were sent to the prison because they overstayed. So, oh. I realized that my my friend, one of my friends, she called me and she said that those people fasting, 
So I managed to, this Ramadan, and we managed to help the prison, not, not the, sorry, uh, it's the uh, detainees. So I'm happy to help you. And I don't know who they are. Doesn't matter. I don't know. And we, my thinking is that they will be happy to receive them. So we managed to open the doors in the Medina Center to give away the and they came there without people knowing them. It doesn't matter. But they took away the ready-made food and all that in the mosque, happens in the mosque. Very secretly, secretly, and nobody knows who they are. And But it's only uh, you know, a certain number of people who are involved in the mosque who knows, OK, that's from Zeta Sabria. When somebody mentions that that is from Zeta Sabria, so they don't even have to ask anyone. You know, sure. It's well protected. So that's the kind of uh, mashallah credibility that's needed to, to really serve that you the service you're doing. So, you know, mashallah, your your heart has been open all this time, and your home has been open to so many people, and uh, that's not something easy, and that's not something actually many people, if not most people in Canada, can really do. Uh, it's one thing that you have an open heart, you have an open wallet. Uh, and, uh, you know, you may open re other resources to the community, but to open your own home, that requires a lot of uh, sacrifice. So I wonder how has your family, uh, you know, dealt with this journey of service to the community? And again, this idea that anybody in, your com in the community can sort of come in and, and ask for help or even stay overnight. And now you have other apartments where you are sheltering needy women and, and others who are going through a difficult time. Uh, what kind of uh, you know family adjustment and sacrifices um, you had to deal with uh, over the past few years? Yes, uh, I think for about within the span of thirty years or so that my husband has been very tolerating, and I um, I don't have the children of myself, but. I have children from the universities you know, who came to help me, oh, sure. and I consider them like my children. So I was happy, I think, uh, in a way, Allah has sent those students to become my grandchildren oh, and sure. to help me out and make me happy. You know, so, But firstly, I would like to emphasize on the love and respect that I have for my husband for, for willing to share with anybody in need in need but alhamdulillah is a uh, second home we make good use of it for the sisters to stay there so that you know he's not uh, too much uh, attached uh, to the, the second home and even if, even there is no work he doesn't have to be in the second home so to to, to i mean they're within the limits in, in that action yeah. and all that and he, you know we respect him for that you know so but as far as the kitchen, our kitchen is concerned during ramadan it's like a, a big mess but he doesn't mind as long as it's, uh, he is not uh, he, he's a soft-spoken person yeah. and uh, the thing everything is hard may allah you know drink and get May, may, may Allah bless your husband, your family, your your you know number of uh, children that you have adopted. Um, yeah. I know personally, you know volunteers in the community who call you their second mother, mashallah. So it's, it's really really inspiring actually to see what you have not only done but what you have uh, built um, and how you inspired so many people around you, mashallah. Uh, you know you you experienced. Uh, near-death experiences in your life um, that you have, you talk about sometimes. Tell us a little bit about what actually happened. Well, it happened um, a number of times, actually. When I was little, I was almost, uh, uh, I was facing death too, because um, it was then in, a, in Jawbaru in Malaysia, within Jawbaru in Singapore. It's a small island that, that my cousin stayed. And uh, we used to spend our holidays there, and it's always either fisherman's land, I should say. So I, because I was young at that time, I was three, four years old, 
and I step into something, uh, what do you call that, ribbon, ribbon out. And it was already, at that time, it was really flooded. Uh, not, sorry, um, the high tide. When mm. the high tide covers that, but I, I, as a child, I couldn't see well. So I uh, fell into the, this, the, this place. And my cousin saw that I fell, and there was no way to be seen my body. So wow. he swam at the mouth of the river to see if I, he caught my leg, my oh, leg, and he gave a tap so that I can, I, you know, I can breathe. I could breathe. Oh, wow. So anyway, that was really good. But as I grew older, there was another time more in the, in the waterfall. The same thing I was at that time. I was already a teacher in Malaysia, and we, we gave tuition to a number of students. And we went to picnic in uh, Kota Tinggi. Kota Tinggi is a waterfall in uh, Johor Bahru, Johor. And uh, there again, I was having uh, playing games with the uh, students and. Uh, I happened to step back on a rock and I fell down. So there again, my body was to do as a fence that's going down uh, the hill. I, I mean, the fence that it because we went to the higher uh, place of the mountain of the um, waterfall. So my body was uh, stuck at there when the lifeguard, you know, helped to help to find my body. I was almost there too at that instant. And the third time, another death. <laughs> I think in the Red Sea in Saudi Arabia, I was dead too, almost dead, because I was walking, wading uh, uh, in the water. I was I, uh, Red Sea, you know, I used to uh, not a swim, but walk. And then uh, I would literally say that I didn't realize I was so far that the, the ship didn't pass by. If had a cheap pass by, also I could because I, I could have me swim. And then the other one is in Montreal, and uh, not Montreal, it is somewhere in, you know, uh, in Ottawa, I think, for the summer camp, the youth summer camp. I was caught up in the freezer. In the freezer, I was supposed to cook for the food the next day. So when I was in the um, around three o'clock in the morning, I realized that I didn't bring the chicken out for the next day for the youth program. So I said, I just tie a little of it, but I was, I went to the kitchen, a big kitchen, and the freezer, walk-in freezer, uh, I took from the freezer to the fridge, from the freezer to the fridge to thaw the, uh, later on, to thaw the chicken. And it was about, what? Uh, for for two hundred people or something, and when I went there in the, the freezer again, um, I I found that the light went off. Then when I checked the door, it's closed. But the freezer door was closed. I could I could hardly open the door. I don't know what happened. There was I was stuck inside. Uh, little that I realized my. My life is really threatening, you know. So I went down to do the sujood, and I I told Allah, Oh Allah, I'm doing this job for you. Please save me. I have nobody else but you. So please save me. I haven't got time to talk to my my husband uh, to ask for forgiveness and my family. So please help me out. About 15 times I opened the door, I couldn't open it. I tried to find something in the dark so that I could open it. I couldn't open it. I said, Lord, Lord, you do accept what I do in my life. Please save me because I'm going to die. In one, two minutes, three minutes, I will be dead. So please, Allah, if you want me to do more work and you know, for your sake and help the people, save me. Yeah. So I tried to open the door. And the door was very nice. So I went out the freezer, even because of the cold, I was almost dead. So I told myself and to Allah was that I will always help the people in order to do to So that was the terrorist part of my life because I was always doing it. 
just for that purpose for Allah to save me. And he did. And I'm, I'm thankful today that I can do more. That was about 15, 16 years ago. And it was really, really scary. And, uh, but also very inspiring because Allah wants me to live. So that's why he gave it to me more joy. So inshallah. And then also uh, uh, last year I was taken ill in Malaysia. So I was stuck there for about eight months. And I was telling myself, I had a very good dream that I asked where is Allah in the dream and twice in the dream. In that like, I was searching for Allah in the dream. But I said again to Allah that please help me so that I can help myself to go to you safely. And he did again, inshallah. So I hope nothing more will happen to me, but please pray for me, inshallah. You know, it will be uh, good for me. The, the purpose of SubhanAllah. You know, I'm actually speechless. I did not know most of what you just talked about. And I'm really, my mind is right now thinking in so many directions about what you just talked about and so much to learn from. Uh, you know, you're talking about good three serious death experiences uh, that you just talked about. And, and there are others apparently as well from what I've heard. Um, you know, really it shows that it, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God chose you for something, something big and something bigger. And it's amazing that you turn to Allah in your very difficult time, the most difficult time in your life, um, asking Allah to give you more opportunity to actually serve, uh, serve him and can you continue to serve even 15 years ago, as you were describing. This is, uh, you know, I'm really speechless at this point. I had a few other questions to ask, but now I'm even wondering what to ask you uh, about further. So what every day you w wake up, what drives you? What motivates you every single day that you wake up? Every single day, that means I told myself, Allah wants me to live more and do more for him. So I start searching for jobs for him. Even if even in this COVID during this uh, pandemic, so even the last um, uh, I think it was last two months for the uh, Ramadan that we had uh, we rented a place down beneath my apartment so that I can serve to the uh, I can serve the community more with the Ramadan baskets and. Uh, and helping the detainees and helping even non-Muslims facing COVID, uh, facing all the stress, and to come forward to me, and uh, and we will do together to help the people uh, in need, inshallah. And uh, I'm still very uh, touched about what happened to me, and I hope I can really work more, inshallah. Um, so, as I said, I have to ask for forgiveness for it, even to the younger generation. If I've been a little nasty because, you know, because of my age, <laughs> they, have to be, I, they have to treat me like a grandma. Um, but I really need to listen to them, too. So there's nothing. Alhamdulillah. There's nothing to the younger people. Inshallah. What? Uh... Was there ever a time that you felt like giving up? I giving up and serving others? Alhamdulillah, I'm, there was never a time that I said, oh, I'm, I'm finishing it. I, I, after this, I'm, I did mention one time, I think, when I was sick, and I told my friend, I think this is my last. I wouldn't want to do it anymore because I'm so tired. And, uh, and my friend said, you, you being tired? I said, yes, if Allah wills, maybe I rest a little. But it's just within the span of two, three weeks, I'm already up again. I say, no, that cannot be. What if I die not doing anything? <laughs> then I mean, I'm a useless person. I better do something for other people. It keeps uh, bothering me. Keep, do something you know, to help people. 
do something to make people happy. So mm-hmm. God, I can be all the to help me to help them to do and to help me for Allah for the sake of Allah and uh, and be happy. So yeah. that, always, of course, you always have to be happy. Otherwise, you cannot do the work. Of course, uh, any work. Yeah, because you you will be feeling you know something emotionally attached that with the work that the passion is there. You know? mm-hmm. The passion my, my parents gave me the passion until today to uh, side on, go on to inshallah so, if Allah wills, he will take me to peace, inshallah. Inshallah. May Allah bless your parents and family, inshallah. So um as we conclude, I have a couple more questions to to wrap up. Uh, one is um, the uh, if people want to help uh, financially or in any way uh, your work and your your organization, the Sabria Foundation, uh, what would be the best way? I mean, there are people watching across Canada and the U.S. Uh, the show and Mexico as well. Uh, what would be the best way for people to reach out to your organization, to learn more about it, and to contribute in some way? I think you can click on tapping sistersabia.com. Sistersabia.com. Okay. And, uh, or they can even call us, you know, 514-489-3487 um, to know specifically how they can you know, donate. And with the time, all the money doesn't matter because with that we can help many people, inshallah. And uh, I'm just too happy to help them out and to answer their questions. Inshallah. Beautiful, and uh, you can see actually the website address as well as the uh, the web page uh, on uh, on the screen. So if anybody wants to be more inspired and learn more about what uh, Sabri has been doing and her dedicated volunteers. Uh, please do check it out. Um, Sister Sabria, um, what advice would you give to the young generation of uh, Canadians, young generation of Canadian Muslims who want to serve the community, who want to give back the way you are doing? Uh, What advice would you give? What would it take for them to get to a point where you are today and serve in whatever capacity they, they can, of course. Not everybody can replicate what you're doing, but in their own capacities, whatever they can do, what would it take? What advice would you give them based on your own experience? Well, based on my own experiences, I think a number of things to consider, for them to consider. So one thing for sure is not to feel this way. Just go on thinking that Allah is, will be with them or will be with the, the person who is depressed or for something, you know. Make another person happy so that you will be happy and Allah will be happy. So everybody will be happy. So in this way, you're distressed or, or you know, you're upset about something. Don't focus on the material things alone. Focus on spiritual things. Like be, um, what do you call that? You have to be focusing on your work and as well as seeking for the love of God. So that in this way, two and two goes together and you'll be happy in life and hereafter, inshallah. And um, be honest with yourself. Work hard. Be honest with yourself and uh, for everything that you do. And also for me, because this is a, um, uh, what should I say, um, our community, with that diverse community. So we have to focus on that, that whatever we want to, to do, we have to focus on that. For example, uh, yeah, you can go ahead and help the other organization that help other people or uh, other people who is really uh, the stress about something, just console them, not to focus on the stress, uh, you know, that you face. Just focus on yourself and Allah and what you're doing is good for yourself, good for Allah, good for people, good for yourself. You know, when you do, it's good for others. So you, life will continue with, in a good uh, perspective, good, uh, uh, what do you call that? How shall I explain that? No, 
through momentum, you know, it's a good way of thinking. Uh, also, you know, once in a while, you have to think of that <laughs> because it's important. So, focus on that too. I don't you are doing that. So, do good while you are alive. Do something good while you are alive so that you have something to, to answer for. Excellent. That's beautiful advice. Thank you. Beautiful advice. Um, so in conclusion, um, Sister Sabria, is there any other life lesson based on your rich life of 73 years now, mashallah, that you have lived? Is there any other life lesson you want to share with us uh, as we conclude this program? What do you mean? I don't understand fully. Is there anything, uh, any inspiration that you have not already shared perhaps or to maybe summarize? Uh, anything from your life experiences, from your childhood up until now that you want to share with us that could be of inspiration as we conclude this program? Yes, I think it be sharing is caring, firstly. Sharing is caring. Caring is sharing. And uh, the little that you have, if you share, you will have barakah. And then you will feel satisfied. So life goes on. And as I've said, Allah is there watching what you do. So you always be yourself, be steadfast. And inshallah, nothing will go wrong if you think of Allah. Inshallah, you, you are there to surfing, into surfing. It's important to think of others, not yourself alone. There's always others there inside you. So, inshallah, everybody will be happy. Because if you do, good, good will come to you. Good things will come to you. And it just comes naturally. You're from a lot of us. You know, so. Incredible. And if I talk about inspiration, there again, you know, as much as you can do, as much as you can focus on um, something and do something good, do it well and good. So don't do things how uh, what happens with you that uh, you will spend. But do something that you like and you focus on that, uh, something you would cause, and you'll be happy, inshallah. Inshallah. Well, with that, uh, Sister Sabria, we're going to have to end, unfortunately, the, our uh, session today. Uh, I wish we could go on. There's so much I could, uh, you know, learn from your uh, life and your inspiration and humanitarian work that you have done. Unfortunately, we're going to have to end here. We want to really thank you from the bottom of our hearts for being here with us today um, and, and really opening your hearts again. Uh, with the, with, the, with the wider community, wider audience, and hopefully inspire them to do whatever bit they can, inshallah, and give and share, as you talked about, uh, with the with the rest of humanity, the rest of their communities, inshallah. So thank you, Sister Sabria, for being here. With us. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Inshallah. Well, folks, uh, with that, we're going to have to uh, end here. Um, there is so much uh, that you and I can do with whatever little means that God has given us. Um, and we can learn from the example of uh, our M Muslim change maker, Sister Sabria Hussein, who um, come, came from a humble background, came from an upbringing of caring and sharing with others, um, and has... Uh, experience at least three if not more near-death experiences and God Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, gave her new life every time for a higher purpose uh, and there's so much we can learn from her life and from her story I hope we can all build on what we have just learned today we I hope we can all uh, do something productive and positive like our sister um, as Sabria has been doing in the community of Montreal and beyond, inshallah. So once again, my friends, brothers and sisters, um, want to thank you for being what for being a, you know such good 
audience today and for watching uh, and for uh, also participating online uh, with your comments and questions. And also, I want to uh, thank uh, Dawanet for uh, being our community partner uh, of Canada Today Show, as well as our wonderful production team that brings this show to you to every day, every week, or in fact, a few times a week. Uh, so once again, this is Taha Ghayur on Canada Today. You're watching Muslim Network TV. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.